Hello, my name is David Lehman, and welcome to As the Key Turns. Today I'd like to talk about one of the most famous incidents at USP Marion, the murder of Officer Hoffman. Now there's been a lot of um, conjecture and rumor and things like that, and it was pointed out to me that perhaps people don't understand what I'm talking about when I talk about this incident. Now what we're going to talk about is the incident that happened later in the afternoon. What happened earlier that day was uh, uh, Silverstein had murdered another officer by the name of Merle Klutz. Now at 8.30 p.m. of the same day this is when this incident takes place. Now <clears throat> I have to get down here on the floor to uh, draw out H units C range. This is C range of H unit on the 22nd of October 1983 and the incident uh, I've got his name here as F. This is Clayton Fountain prisoner number 89129-132. Uh, what happens is he is in the recreation cage because the warden had ordered recreation to resume that day. So they put him in there Three officers are on the range as is required in the uh, control unit because H unit is the control unit. It was that way even when I was there um, six years after this incident. So um, three officers are right here. They remove this guy. This is a this is a recreation cage. Right back here are windows on another wall. This recreation cage is probably four or five feet from that exterior wall and uh, fountain one time busted out all these windows for fun so these officers all leave with him and they don't search him one of the officers said that he was so upset from that day uh, that they were told to start doing the recreation again and the murder that had just happened to their friend earlier that day in this very unit not on this range that was on B range. Um, this is C range. This is upstairs. Uh, they were so upset that they didn't even shake down Fountain. They didn't even pat search him. Anyway, they take him out. They place handcuffs on him in his front. And the three of them, or, yeah, the four of them, three officers and, and one prisoner, Fountain, walk all the way down here. This one officer, well, um, I won't use names except for the, the victim, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, we'll just call him CO number three. He stays here and way up here somewhere off of this thing is where the, the lock box is being operated which open and close all these doors. These, these are cells and each of these have bars and it's just bars between you and them. And the bars are spaced about so far apart. About like this. Enough that you can't get your head through it. So all four of them walk down and they, the officers, all three, all two officers stop here. The one officer stays up here near three or four cell. So these two officers stop here and Fountain continues to walk. His cell is number 16, but he goes down to 18 and he has his back to these two officers. And he talks to the inmate in the cell. Now I can't say that the inmate in the cell did anything wrong, so I can't identify him. It's possible he did something wrong, but no one saw it. Not at the time, not now, and no one ever admitted it. This guy in 18 ever did anything. Anyway, um, he's here for 15 to 30 seconds, Fountain is, talking with this fellow in this cell. One of these officers, uh, officer, we'll just call him Officer CO1, um, hears what he thinks is Fountain's handcuffs hit the floor. Now, that's not true because other officers unrelated to this event later saw Fountain with his handcuffs still on one hand. So they didn't hit the floor. Fountain turns around and these two officers are here and he yells, you MFers, and you know, he, he said it. Uh, Want some of me? Come and get it. He rushes these two officers and he starts stabbing this CO number one. 
Mr. Hoffman, who is right behind him, comes to his assistance. And they're fighting. All of this happens. One of the officers here, um, the number, the CO1 here, yells, he's got a knife. And he's already been stabbed at this point. This number three officer, CO3, we'll call him CO3, he comes running down a range to assist the other two who are now locked in combat with Frank uh, uh, Fountain right here. Then, uh, I believe it was Mr. Hoffman, yells, everybody off the range. So all three officers start retreating down the range. At this point, right in front of three or four, where this officer was standing, Officer Hoffman is attacked again by Franklin, who's been chasing him back down the range. He's attacked here. Officer uh, CO1 and CO3 turn and try to fend off the attack on Officer Hoffman. Now there's an officer who's at this grill. Here's a shower. Just past the shower is a big grill that goes across this whole top, like the top of this here. And there's a door here, a grill, but it doesn't lock except with a key. Like you slam it shut, it won't shut. It's not like a normal door. You have to close it and turn the key to make it shut. There's an officer standing there. He has come from downstairs. He's come upstairs. There's five officers assigned to this, this unit. Three of them are actively involved here. Number four. The fourth one is running a lockbox, and he can't go and help anyone. He cannot. He has all the keys to the unit. If anyone gets a hold of those keys, they could take over the entire unit and murder everybody. So he cannot leave. So the number one officer comes up, and the number one officer, he's the number one officer of the unit, he comes up, and, and he's assisting or what he thinks is assisting, but what he does is he has a nightstick and he holds the door shut because he doesn't have the key. That's what the guy on the, on the lock box, he just holds the door shut. And at that point, Officer Hoffman, is, they, they fought um, Franklin or Fountain off. They've gotten to here and they're trying to get everybody off the range who are now all injured and Officer Hoffman slips and falls right here in front of the shower. Probably because the inmates have planned this from the beginning. They probably threw some baby oil there on the floor with the water and it makes it extremely slick and they do it all the time. That's why this CO here, this correctional officer, is talking to the guy in four because the guy in four has stopped him and asked him a bunch of questions, probably on purpose to assist in this murder that's about to take place down here. All these guys are in on it, in my opinion. Can't prove it. It's never been proven. It never went to court. But I'm telling you from my experience, that's what was happening. That's why this officer was up here. Because they always stop you and ask you for stupid things. And we're more or less required to take care of it. So now instead of fighting three guys, he was only fighting two. So they get back up here. Officer Hoffman is down on the ground and he's kicking at the inmate. Another officer tries to assist him. Now he's got a stick. But every time um, Fountain has an opportunity, he stabs Hoffman again, every time, way up here. The other officers, they're, they're up here trying to protect him. They finally, one officer is on his hands and knees because he's been stabbed and he's doing this and he grabs Officer Hoffman and he drags him back with him. That's this, this CO that was right here during the attack, the one that was injured in the first place, the one that Officer Hoffman came to his assistance. The, the, the CO3 here is doing his best to help, but he doesn't have a weapon. He got one from this other officer that's now holding this, this door shut. He's holding it shut, but it doesn't lock. So, the number three officer here forces the door open and drags Officer Hoffman off the range, along with uh, the other CO. They get off the range, finally. 
Now, deuces has gone off. That's where you hit the phone, two, two, two. Or there's a body alarm. It was a little red body alarm. Looks like a radio like a, the cops have on their hip. They had pushed at the officer that was working the log box as soon as he heard um, the inmate start screaming at the staff. He didn't even wait to hear for a knife or any of that stuff. He hit the body alarm right away. So as soon as Franklin started screaming, you know, uh, you mothers want a, want a piece of me, he hits the body alarm. So now the entire institution is starting to move that way. There are two off-duty staff downstairs, which is as far away as you can get from this place. They're downstairs in the number one office with the number one, and they're looking over records. They got a new lieutenant, and they got a correctional um, counselor in there, and he's showing them what's what. They run up the stairs too, and the stairs are right about here, just, just off the screen here that you can see. They run up the stairs. We have the third, or the fourth officer come up the stairs, well, the fifth officer, there's four here. There's three that are on the range, one at the lockbox, and then the other one from downstairs runs up. So now all five officers are there, plus the two that were off duty, they're there. Now there's seven officers there. They finally get this just past the shower as the, the grill, another grill. There's a grill right here, too. And this grill is open, and it's the same way. You've got to shut it and lock it with a key. So if these guys could have got past here and shut this door and locked it with a key, uh, Fountain would have been trapped on this side, but he wasn't. So people say, well, there was um, malfeasance. There was cowardness. There wasn't really the only mistakes that were made, in my opinion, was they started running recreation again and that's none of these officers had anything to do with that they were not part of that decision so i don't blame anybody here even the officers that was up here holding the grill shut he thought they were going to try to take over the unit so he did what he thought at that time at that moment what he thought was best whether or not in hindsight it was i don't know the way things have changed, or the way things did change later, what would have happened, we would have taken, we would have strip searched a fountain in his cell. That wasn't done that day. He would have been put in uh, cuffs behind his back, or if he's going somewhere other than recreation, we'd put a belly chain on him so that his, his hands can't move away from him. But he would have been put behind his back, and he would have had leg irons on him, and all three officers would be right there. When he came out, one officer would physically grab his handcuffs and hold him. They didn't do that. They just allowed him to walk several steps. These things are about um, five or six feet wide. So at this point, these officers are somewhere about 18 feet from him while he's got his back toward him. Who knows what he was doing in that, in that instance. So he wasn't strip searched like we did when I worked in H unit, the control unit. Then he would have been taken here and he would have had all of his stuff um, taken off of him after this door was shut. When he leaves, he'd be strip searched again and taken back and put in his cell. And the reason for that is there would be no way that he would have been able to conceal a handcuff key Remember, because when he went down here, when he turned around, he's only got one hand cuffed, and so now he's free. And he had no leg irons on. So all of those things were changed after this incident. Um, one of the names that I will mention was a guy named Kenny Gabbard, who today has a, a scholarship named after him for very good reason. And Ken Gabbard was the kind of guy that uh, he told it like it was, but he had a lot of compassion for people. And uh, he told me that this was possibly the worst day uh, of his entire life, that in one day, two people that he knew were viciously murdered. And this, this guy, this fountain, was probably the worst. He murdered a guy 
he murdered uh, um, Officer Hoffman for no reason other than to up the score with his buddy Silverstein. I mean, he had no connection to Officer Hoffman at all, other than he was there. So he was just, he would have killed any of these officers. It wouldn't have made any difference. So these cells, I'd like to, to give you the, the round out. These cells are about eight or uh, five feet wide, five or six feet wide, and there's 18 of them. There's a law library, which takes the place of cell number one. Past that is the shower, and the shower has got about two cells. So it looks about like this, like two cells. There's um, shower heads here, two shower heads, and then there's a big grill and a little door. And right outside of it, you, you have to actually step up and down. This is this hallway here is basically extremely smooth concrete. So when it's wet, it's very slick. And they add baby oil to it sometimes to make it even worse. That's probably why Officer Hoffman fell. Um, there's a grill right here, a door uh, uh, here that could have been shut, wasn't. These wreck cages are... are half a cell house, half the half a cell range, I should say. Now up here is a big open area and over on this, as you're looking on the right hand side, would be a door that would go outside to the outside recreation cages. And this is the this is the physical layout. Now there was a exercise bicycle there with a thing sticks off of it that you could do these push up things. I don't know what you want to call it. You stand and you grab a bar and then you just push yourself up and down as an exercise. Um, each one of these things had that there. So I hope that this makes it more clear. But I wanted to go over it again just so that you really understood what was going on. There was three officers on this range when this kicked off. Two were down here and one was being decoyed by an by a inmate in four. There was a fourth officer who was in direct observation at the lockbox, which is a big box that you open and close all these cell doors with. He can't move from that spot because he has all the keys to this. The number one officer is down in the office along with a correctional counselor and a brand new lieutenant who are off duty. They just happen to be there. When they heard this scuffle, they knew, the, the lieutenant knew immediately that something was going on and so did the correctional counselor and they both ran up here just as quick as they possibly could. And they were still here and they still, well they got there in time to still see uh, Fountain stabbing Officer Hoffman and the other officers fighting. They did have uh, one baton that was passed to them down the range that one of the officers was using to swing at and try to defend Officer Hoffman, who's now on the ground mortally wounded, while the other guy, who's on his hands and knees, grabbed him and dragged him off the range. The other officer that came from downstairs blocked the doorway uh, physically. He couldn't lock the door, but he blocked the grill so that they couldn't get off the range and one of the officers had to force it open to get them off the range. And then later, um, Fountain was taken down and put on B range, which was where Silverstein was and where the other murder had taken place that morning. So they got the chat back and forth and uh, talk about the respective murders that took place that day. So I hope that this clears it up. I hope that this is clear enough for you to see and understand um, exactly what what occurred in the, the physical layout of the place. So this was a suggestion from one of the people from Patreon and uh, if you want to support me by all means go to As the Key Turns at patreon.com and I have the documents that tell this story by the officers and other staff who were there on that day and the SIS who investigated special investigative supervisor and the FBI won't tell me anything because I asked them um, some late time later I'll try to do this very same thing for the murder of the officer Klutz that was killed by inmate Silverstein. So make any comments you like, ask any questions, I'll answer everything that I can. And thanks for watching.